I don't know if you've ever thought about silk very much or where it comes from or, or what properties it has. And I certainly didn't. Um, to me, silk was a fabric that was very beautiful. It felt luxurious against the skin and it was obviously very expensive. My family in India wore it all the time. Um, but I never really had occasion to think about where it came from and what it was until I started thinking about waste. And because of the waste we produce, the application of natural materials in future technologies, being that we absolutely have to move away from hydrocarbons, natural materials have become so interesting um, to work with. And silk, I think, is the only material, or maybe one of the only materials, that has such a long and ancient history and tradition of use by people in fabrics, but also has remained in continuous use and also has a very, I think, surprising technological future. The silks that you know and you probably have at home are made from one, um, <laughs> that's expensive silks, <laughs> shop, from the little shop next door. The silks that you have at home are probably made by one particular insect. And this is the only insect that is truly um, domesticated. And it's called Bombyx mori. Bombyx mori is a moth. It did not exist before a few million years ago. And it did not exist because it was domesticated by, um, by farmers in China. Genetic science doesn't... Uh, hasn't validated exactly how long ago this happened, but taken together with archaeological evidence, we could say that it's about 4,000 years old. And the moth is very interesting because its, it's wild ancestor was camouflage, it flew very quickly, um, it, it lived in the wild very successfully. But in domesticating it, this moth has lost all its coloration, it cannot fly to any great degree, it um, needs human beings even to help them mate. And this is the life cycle, it undergoes a cycle of development that's called um, complete metamorphosis, in which it starts life as a caterpillar, and it ends life in a form, in an adult form that looks completely different. And somewhere along that, um, that uh, line of development, it stops. It stops and it pauses and it looks like nothing happens. And that is a very dangerous thing for an insect to do because of predators and because of pathogens like bacteria and fungi. And, and what it does in order to protect itself is produce a protein that we know as silk. It's actually two proteins intertwined and it emerges from the tubes inside the body and it's a liquid and when it hits the salivary glands of the caterpillar and it and it emerges into the air it solidifies and turns into a thread and that thread is really something quite incredible because the cocoon of this insect is about this big but if you unraveled it it would extend to two or three kilometers in length And the thread is extremely fine. It's about a thousand times thinner than a human hair. And yet it has incredible properties of high tensile strength and extreme elasticity. And that's because the protein building blocks that it's made from are very, very, very boring. They're very repetitive. <laughs> they, they just go on and on and on in the same combination. But the strength that it gives it has not been um, gone unnoticed over the millennia that humans have been using it. It has been used as uh, surgical suturing in ancient India and ancient Greece. Um, uh, Genghis Khan uh, gave thin, very thin shirts of silk to his military um, in order to protect them from the effect of removing uh, missile arrows from the body. The, um, in the Wild West, with the development of the Colt revolver and all of the gun crime that we unfortunately still have, silk body armor was used. Um, the Nazis used it to make parachutes that were woven in such a way that the material became fire retardant. But it's not just about the extreme strength of the material, although that's incredibly interesting. The thing about Bombyx mori, this domesticated silk moth, is um, the life cycle isn't entirely sustainable, although it does lock carbon in at many stages. So it feeds on mulberry leaves and those trees trap the carbon it creates the silk product that if it's utilized in materials, it, it traps the carbon. But at some stage, in order to unravel this two kilometers of thread from the insect, it has to be killed in the cocoon, either by stifling or boiling, 
neither which are very nice. But that's not the only way to produce silk. They can be allowed to escape from the cocoon. In order to do so, though, they vomit an enzyme called cocoonase, which is a kind of rusty brown color, and it dirties the cocoon and it breaks the cocoon, so you don't get this very smooth line of fabric that you can then so, um, weave together. Neri Oxman, when she was at the um, MIT Media Lab, Professor Oxman, um, decided to do it a different way. She asked the caterpillars to be her collaborators. She created architectural structures and seeded them with thousands of silkworms and told them, go ahead and build the structure and created a series of architectural objects that were uh, both sustainable and elastic and strong. And as, as I was speaking about, w silk is um, a possible alternative to plastics, because we're very, very good at making plastics, We've got to get away from the hydrocarbons, so what do we use instead? Here's a natural biological material that's entirely biodegradable, that we can use as a substitute for plastics, and also for plastic cups and bags and things like that, but also for electronics, because this, as you saw, is, is a massive, um, massive problem for us in creating waste. And that's because silk, as a protein, brings biology and technology together. Um, in, a, in an extremely interesting way. It has been used to create electronic human um, electronic interfaces, sensors that can go into the body and report back on physiological symptoms or whether my mother took her medication or not. It's also been used to preserve, um, to stabilize vaccines that ordinarily need refrigeration and also chemotherapy drugs and antibiotics that have been stabilized for over a decade. Um, for example, at the Mayo Clinic in, in the United States. And it's also been used in regenerative medicine to uh, implant into the body, to ask the body to help repair itself. Um, some studies have shown that patients have walked into operating theatres not being able to speak and have come out um, doing much better with vocal cord paralysis implants based uh, upon silk. All of these innovations that I'm showing you have come from the Bombix Mori, um, domesticated silk moth, but it's not the only silk moth there is. And we have not really been open to this because I always thought, and many people think, that silk has only come from China. But in fact, it's only been looked for in China, and that's a common understanding. Dr. Irene Good at Harvard is a textile expert. She was, she sadly died of cancer um, before I had the chance to interview her, but I've read everything she's written, and she um, is an archeologist, and she said, well, she noted that when you excavate in China, if you find a fabric, you will check whether it's silk. But if you find it in Mexico or Madagascar or Mozambique or Cameroon or India, you don't tend to do that. But she did. And she was able to look at the silks, the shape of it, determine what kind of orifice it came out of and think about the kind of wild um, moths that produced it. And there are many, many, many wild moths that have been used by humans across the world over time since time immemorial in order to use um, and make products from the silk that they created. It has also been known to science for at least, from at least the 16th, um, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. In 1700, this woman, Maria Marianne, took a ship from Holland to Suriname and what I think was the first actual scientific voyage Darwin was a doctor. Many uh, scientists who got on ships were military men. She went expressly to see how insects on the other side of the world were metamorphosizing. She's also called the mother of ecology because a lot of men of science were looking at butterflies and moths pinned dead to, to pieces of cardboard. And she said, I want to see them in the wild. And she went and she found um, insects with the guidance of is that, is that my time? <laughs> she, with the guidance of um, people who had been enslaved, brought from Africa to work on the Dutch sugarcane plantations, and also indigenous Sur Suriname um, uh, local people who were experts in their natural biology. So none of, these, none of these wild moths were mysteries to the indigenous people there, but it's just that the rest of the world didn't know about it. She actually took... Um, an indigenous woman back to Holland with her. And that woman wrote the text of her great magnum opus scientific publication with her, but we don't know who that woman was. But some of the animals that she recorded were silk producing moths that she offered to Europe for an alternative to the, to the Bombix Mori. Wild moths are incredible. They're enormous, they're colorful, and they produce a very, very interesting silk. Um, and the reason 
there were many women involved in their discovery whose, whose notes had been impossible to find, even though their insects were used by the Natural History Museum to catalogue um, the, the species we know today. The reason wild silk is so interesting, as discovered by these women, is because they, while the Bombyx mori was um, developing under human hands, these wild moths continue to have, face the challenges that they experience in difficult environments, which um, included uh, infections, um, but also the difficulties of the natural environment. And as a result, the silk fibers of wild moths display incredible breaking stress of a higher magnitude than domesticated silk does. And what's and that means that different technological um, applications are now possible for scientists working with wild silks today. And what's also interesting is that these bra the breaking stress and the strength that they display um, align quite well with the other silk that has been coveted by scientists for hundreds of years, and that is spider silk. Spiders make uh, a number of different kinds of silk to wrap their eggs, to create their webs, to drop from, and some of these silks ha are so strong that they're five times tougher than steel. Some scientists say that if you took a spider and you made them the size of a human, the web that they create would be strong enough to stop a jetliner in its path. The um, spiders, however, don't really like being domesticated. <laughs> which is not very surprising. There have been um, machines made over the last few hundred years in many different parts of the world to extract silk directly from the spiders. They get very angry. Um, and they're also cannibalistic. So this was a cape produced, a large um, uh, piece of clothing made of Madagascan golden orb spider silk. That is the natural color of the spider silk. Um, but it took um, Simon two million spiders and about eight years, because as he sent Malagasy women out to collect the spiders in baskets, they'd fill the baskets and they'd come back home and there'd just be one very happy looking spider <laughs> <laughs> on the inside. And because of that, there have been uh, scientists looking at different ways to produce silk. The production of enough silk to make these things, particularly spider silk, has been extremely difficult. And so other ideas have been um, looked at. This is um, Randy Lewis, he's a professor in, um, in America, Colorado, and he has genetically modified E. coli bacteria as well as yeast to produce spider silk. He's also created this mammal which has been known in the press as the spider goat because when you milk it, spider silk comes out in, in its milk. Of course, he used the truncated, a shortened form of the protein. And, and the thing about spider silk is when the spider exudes it, the protein folds in a particular way that gives it the properties that cannot be expressed in milk that needs to be taken back into a form that's um, solid again. And it's not just um, moths or spiders by any means. There are a whole range of animals um, in the world that make biological materials that we would do well to emulate. You, you know, people say that what science and technology has struggled to, to mimic, a spider does on a, bi on a diet of bugs. We've not been able to get there yet, but there are lots of other creatures that do this. There's a tiny shrimp-like animal that makes, uh, spins a thread that's so strong, it falls somewhere between the cement a barnacle makes to adhere itself to the ship's hulls, and spider silk. The image you see here is of the pinna nobilis. It's like the mussels that you eat, and it doesn't spin a thread, it blow molds a thread from its foot that anchors it into the Mediterranean floor. It is critically endangered because of the heating Mediterranean and because of pollution, but it has long been used to create fabrics. This is one from Sardinia that I photographed a couple of years ago. And the very interesting thing about this silk is that it's self-healing. It can repair itself. And so we, I think it, it, it's been very difficult to work with silk fabrics, but silk is a great place to start. But any biological material that can help us prevent the further destruction of our nature and to think about the kinds of materials that we can be more like nature and not wasting, um, but preserving our world will be very interesting to continue looking at. Thank you. <laughs>